So here we go again, another book depicting chaos inside the Trump White House. This one certainly matters. It's penned by Washington Journalism Institution, Bob Woodward. Four and a half decades after reporting that blew open the Watergate scandal, Woodward's tome tells of vitriol bombast aides who steal documents off the president's desk, for instance, to keep him from killing the NAFTA free trade deal or killing Syria's Assad. It's captivating reading, apparently, but do we learn anything that's surprising? The Donald Trump in the book, well, it's the same real estate magnet turned reality TV star turned populist presidential candidate who's been in the public eye since the 1980s. Voters knew there would be plenty of spectacles on his watch. So why are they more and more, not just in the US, choosing shit shoot from the hip bombasts as their leaders. Speaking of bombast and spectacles, uh, Washington figuring out what to make of the unprecedented scenes witnessed at the outset of confirmation hearings for Trump's Supreme Court justice pick. In the age where everyone and everything seems to be on the record, does that reduce governance to a choice between obstructionists on both sides, egged on by their fired up base? and burgeoning autocrats who dismiss checks and balances. Simply put, well, how is democracy doing these days? Today in the France 24 debate, we're uh, looking at uh, what the Woodward book reveals about the era we live in. And joining us uh, from New York, he worked with Bob Woodward on the agenda inside the Clinton White House, presidential historian David Greenberg, who teaches at Rutgers University. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you. From Washington, Joshua Mitchell, professor of political theory at uh, Georgetown University. Thank you for being with us. Delighted to be here. And we welcome back Mark Porter, president of Republicans overseas France. How are you? Very good. How are you, Frank? All right. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, lots of uh, West Wing bad-mouthing laid bare in fear. That's the name of the book. More worrying advisors and cabinet members who shun the president's orders in the name of national security. Sanam Shantier explains. Let's look at the world and your administration and you. Right. Well, I assume that means it's going to be a negative book. But, well, you know, I'm, some, I'm sort of 50% used to that. That's all right. Some are good and some are bad. Sounds like this is going to be a bad one. This is a conversation between Donald Trump and a reporter who was partly responsible for bringing down Richard Nixon in 1974. This time, Washington Post journalist Bob Woodward is publishing a tunnel book about the U.S. president. In fear, Trump in the White House, current and former aides are quoted as saying they had sensitive documents to prevent the American leader from signing them. The 448-page book also quotes the White House chief of staff as having doubts about Trump's mental faculties, saying he's an idiot. We're in crazy town. John Kelly has since denied this account. Woodward also claims Trump called for the assassination of the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad. The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, however, has cast doubt on this story. I um, have the pleasure of being privy to those conversations um, when we've dealt with each chemical weapon strike, when we've dealt with all of the responses, when we've dealt with everything. And I have not once ever heard the president talk about assassinating Assad. For his part, Trump has decreed the quotes and stories on Twitter as frauds, a con on the public. Fear Trump in the White House is set for a public release on September the 11th and already sits atop Amazon's bestseller list. So, uh, David Greenberg, uh, full disclosure, I didn't get an advanced copy, so I haven't read it yet. Uh, But I did look at Michael Wolff's Fire and Fury, which came out in January. How is this book going to be different? Well, I think for one thing, uh, Woodward is a deeply sourced reporter. He maybe doesn't talk to every single individual in the White House, but he talks to multiple sources. Um, As I recall, the Wolf book, he had talked to Steve Bannon and had a kind of couple of key figures he relied on. With Woodward, 
you really see kind of a full range of voices from the administration, often from outside the administration, from the opposing party, from the Senate. Uh, so I haven't read this book either, but I think the depth of Woodward's reporting, which has sort of made him really the greatest reporter in our times, if not in American history, uh, is is going to be on you in this book. Well, well talk, talk, t- talk us through it. Your experience when you worked on the agenda about the Clinton uh, uh, White House, how, how, how do you go about it in those in those cases? Well, you know, that was an interesting book because it began while George Bush Sr. was president and the economy was the big issue. And we began reporting on the Bush White House and its handling of the economy. And it became apparent that Bush was going to uh, lose the election. And so Woodward decided to kind of start from scratch and do the Clinton White House. He had a whole team, a whole new team in there, all new sources to cultivate, all new people to talk to. And he was very methodical. You know, if one source told us about an important meeting where Clinton was president, present, Woodward would find out everyone who was at that meeting and try to talk to them all. And if somebody said, well, the president blew up and he turned purple and he said thus and such, Woodward would check it out with the other sources. Sometimes accounts differ a little bit and Woodward, you know, would have to kind of reconcile that. But he's really committed not to holding a brief for any one White House official or one ideological point of view, but to bringing out the full range of perspectives. And that's often why I think his books about the White House show so much dissent and disagreement and even chaos, because he captures really the variety. It's sort of a myth that official sources speak with one voice. This is a kind of popular uh, layman's critique of reporting that, oh, they're just getting the sources from the administration. But if you really listen to these people and you get them to talk on background, you know, knowing that they're not going to be pinpointed by name as the source, you really see a divergence of viewpoints uh, in any administration. Mark Porter, uh, your, your thoughts on this, because we've seen the president this Wednesday tweet that it's a work of pure fiction. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I agree with what was said in terms of their various different viewpoints. And I've been in some of these meetings, and my recollections of what happened and other people's recollections aren't exactly the same. Uh, this happens especially under a lot of pressure and things are happening. Also, in, in meetings, it's not just one person talking, everyone else listening. So you have breakaway sorts of discussions on the sides and so these things. Uh, I haven't had a copy of the book either, so I'm not privileged to have read it in advance either. But the title of the book, Fear, okay, it's sort of suspect why would this particular title have been chosen, as well as the, the date when it was released. This is the time for sales right before the bid terms. So that's a little suspect here too. Also, everyone that I've talked to today uh, has disputed what they have said has been attributed to them in terms of quotes and these things. So that's a little troubling. So the quote fear, if I understand it correctly, has to do with the conversation that Trump had on the campaign trail with Bob Woodward about the, uh, his relationship towards power itself. But it can also be construed as fear over the Russia investigation. Sure, it can also be used as a great title to sell more books. So there's all sorts of things that are interesting here. Uh, Why this book is done in the middle of the administration, right before midterms, is is the the suspect part that I find a little troubling. Joshua Mitchell, you find it suspect? May I jump in? Uh, A bit, but I think one one of the things that we have to Uh, pay attention to is the fact that... um, that uh, we're dealing with a president who really doesn't have party discipline. He doesn't have a party whose members are going to know that what they say is going to be held against them for years to come. We don't know what the Republican Party is. And so in these ages of transition, you're bound to have a tremendous amount of chaos. Uh, and, and probably Woodward's book shows this. I haven't read it yet, uh, but nothing in it is going to surprise me. But the other thing I think is terribly important to remember is that Trump's style is chaotic. Read The Art of the, Print, or the, Art of the Deal or look at the TV show 
uh, apprentice, he thrives on chaos. He needs chaos in order to make decisions. He is not a diplomat. And I think that's what people are holding against him. Yeah, well, among the anecdotes, uh, as reported by the Washington Post, one involving is now former economic advisor Gary Cohen. Uh, he, according to Woodward, Cohen stole a letter off of Trump's desk that the president was intending to sign to formally withdraw the United States from a trade agreement with South Korea. Cohen later told an associate he removed the letter, quote, to protect uh, national security and that Trump did not notice that it went missing. Joshua Mitchell, should we be uh, worried, us citizens of the rest of the planet? Uh, I'm sure these sorts of things happen in every administration. Every administration? Uh, is Trump chaotic? Yes, he is. But I think we have to remember, yes, of course, in every administration, crazy things like this happen. People are trying to watch out for the president's best interests. There's a certain amount of trust, a certain amount of distrust. This is the nature of politics in the executive office. There, there's also a protocol for this thing. If Cohen was so concerned, he could have appealed to many other people in terms of reporting these kinds of issues. It sounds a bit like exaggeration here that he stole a paper off. This almost sounds like a, the theme of a, a, a fiction book rather than things that would Well, the, the, that, that quote as well, uh, uh, saying that let's go and effing assassinate Assad and Mattis telling his aides, look, it's not going to happen. And Mattis said it didn't happen. Mattis said he absolutely didn't say that. It didn't happen. So uh, someone said something might have been happening, but someone said something. This is hearsay. This is he said, she said kind of things. And why Woodward, I, such a I great journalist, would come um, up with this type of book I is David, David Greenberg. On the agenda. Yes, I, I work for Woodward on the agenda and he never invents anything, full stop. Everything that he puts in his books comes either from the person who said it, the person they said it to, or sometimes to a third party in the room. So if Mattis had that, you know, is quoted in the book as saying Trump said that to him, that came either from Mattis or someone in the room or someone to whom Mattis said it. He may obviously, for political reasons now, feel it's, uh, you know, prudent to deny it so he doesn't get fired. So but who is this person? Assured, I mean, we don't know. This doesn't make any sense. other books, time will prove this correct. Uh, let me ask you. Uh... Both Ari Fleischer from the Bush administration and Paul Begala from the Clinton administration have tweeted in the last 24 hours. Yeah, I complained at the time. But everything that Woodward put in the book about our administrations checked out. David David Greenberg, uh, do you agree with what Joshua Mitchell says that you know taking documents off the off the president's desk so he can't sign them that that's something that happens that's happened in the past with other leaders? No, I don't know. I doubt that's ever happened. Surely you're or not going to say categorically that that's the there. case. But that's an extraordinary <laughs> oh, thing to go on. Uh, that is a you silly know, statement. I'm a presidential historian, and I've looked, I've read a lot of presidential history. Um, you don't see routine No routine one's going to say that, of course. Right? Of economic advisors removing documents so that the president won't sign them. This is an extraordinary presidency, an extraordinarily unusual presidency. And I think that's something we knew, but that's something that Woodward's reporting apparently confirms in spades. So uh, are, are you uh, scared or are you reassured by what you're hearing uh, in the sense that uh, his entourage, uh, well, keeps things, uh, how should we say, centered and balanced? Well, I think it's better than the alternative, I guess. You know, although some of the more stable, reasonable members of the administration, like Cohn, like H.R. McMaster, you know, a handful of others, have already gone. Uh, one has to hope that there are cooler heads around the president who can exert a moderating influence. But, you know, Trump is a very... Uh, 
you know, special psychological profile. He's, he's not like most people we've had as president. He is, as somebody said, uh, someone who thrives on chaos. And so the degree to which we can feel comforted by the moderating hands of this advisor or that, I think, is, you know, is, is real, but it's limited. Why, are, why, when you, well, we've been preparing the show, Joshua Mitchell, one of the questions we've been asking ourselves is, we know Donald Trump's style. We've known him since the 1980s. He's not an unknown quantity. So why did people pick somebody who's got this shoot from the hip personality uh, to have the nuclear codes to be in charge of, uh, uh, of things like uh, trade deals and, and, and relations with, uh, with allies and, and foes. You mean voted for him? Yes. Okay. Well, I can answer that. I voted for him, and so did 35 million uh, think, other Americans because he was the best choice. And this shoot from the hip, 65. what he says, as you know, is not always policy. He thinks out loud. That's quite all right. You're an American. You know how we do this that sort of thing. This book looks like an another exaggeration. We had Omarosa's book a couple of weeks ago or whatever. We've had these books come out. They're all saying the same thing. They don't like the guy. Okay, good enough, but many Americans, 35 million of them, voted for him. Let's for the right reason, and he's going to make a great jo reason. Joshua Mitchell. Let's 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 be clear. So what we have, we have a number of books opposed to President Trump, and now the man who wears the mantle of authority from the for the '60s generation, Mr. Woodward, comes out with a book. Nothing is going to change. Trump is Trump. There's not going to be anybody who's going to change their vote because of this. Um, you asked the question, why did people vote for Trump? Some voted for him. Others, a huge number, I think, voted against the alternative. And that alternative was both a Democratic Party and a Republican Party who had drunk the Kool-Aid of globalism, had abandoned the middle class, and these people were simply fed up of being told, either by the Republicans, they were going to be collateral damage to the necessary historical movement toward globalization, or being told by the Democrats that they're deplorables who don't count. Josh, we're going to have to, I'm going to have to interrupt you because we have to take a very quick I break. He will be president we, again. We, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We have to take a very quick Certainly. break, but uh, uh, the reason, the, the style of Trump, the, the, uh, the shoot from the hips style, we're going to be talking about it when we come back. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're uh, reacting to the latest uh, revelations that will be hitting the stands next Tuesday from Bob Woodward's latest uh, book, the longtime Washington Post investigative reporter's book, Fear, in goes inside the Trump White House. Uh, with us to talk about it uh, from New York, David Greenberg, uh, who teaches at uh, Rutgers University and who worked with Woodward on the agenda inside the Clinton White House. Welcome back as well to Joshua Mitchell, who teaches political, political theory at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And here in the studio, Mark Porter, president of Republicans Overseas France. Welcome back to all of you. Uh, Joshua Mitchell, just before the break, uh, we were uh, discussing uh, why uh, you, you, the, why uh, you know, Donald Trump, we, we knew we, we could expect this kind of bombast uh, with his uh, presidency. Um, how is it going to work, though, the, the, this sort of unfiltered approach uh, that he has uh, to uh, politics? Is that a sign of the times, the fact that we've picked this kind of a leader? Well, it's in one sense, of, of course, it is. Everybody says whatever comes to their mind. Uh, but with respect to Trump, I think there's something that's very important to remember, and that is that uh, p politics is rhetoric and governance is policy. And he's very loose with language, and I believe he does it deliberately. He is not an idiot. What he does is he sends out tweets, and he gets responses back. It's much like a dolphin with sonar. And, and then he says, thank you very much for the information. So his, his tweets are, in a way, a sixth sense, which he uses 
to gather information. Is it unorthodox? Of course it is. I do not have a Twitter account. But that is the way that he, he gathers the information that he needs. He's always pressing the boundaries to see how strong things that seem to be strong really are, whether that's an oppositional candidate in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, whether it's NATO, whether it's Iran. He's always pushing. And this is not what diplomats do. Diplomats want to ease the pressures, and he does precisely the opposite. And that's the moment what we're in right, that we're in right now. We're in a world that's deeply unstable. The diplomats want to say everything's fine, and everybody knows things are not fine. Everything is falling apart, whether it's in Europe or in America. And I'm not saying that Trump is the ideal candidate for the future, but he certainly is the candidate for our times, and that everything is being pressed and dismantled slowly but surely. Everything's falling apart, you're saying? I'm saying, for example, NATO. I mean, it's a, an institution that has been in place for a very long time. What Trump is trying to do is not dismantle NATO. What he's trying to do is to press the NATO nations to find out to what extent they're committed to it, to what extent they're going to push back. He's always finding out whether someone is going to push back. That is his method. It is not a diplomat's method. But he's at the right time because I think all of us have this sense we're not really sure what's stable anymore. You've, the very subject of your, uh, of your section here right now is about the stability of democracy. I'm not making this up. It's already inscribed in what you're doing here. So we're all at this place where we're not sure what's, what's substantive and what's not. And Trump is the president who's trying to establish that. Some people are very upset about it. Others are cheering him on. All right. In his latest, uh, one of his latest tweets, Donald Trump wondering why they don't change libel laws in Washington. Earlier uh, among his tweets, he also said the Woodward book has already been refuted and discredited. Quotes were made up frauds, a con on the public. Likewise, other stories and quotes. Woodward is a Dem operative, question mark. Notice the timing, uh, question mark. Uh, David Greenberg, what is that? This, this rule by Twitter, what does it tell you about uh, uh, the way politics works in the digital age? Yeah, it's interesting to see some of Trump's talking points echoed by his supporters say about the timing as though, you know, it's trying to influence the election. Woodward, uh, you know, came uh, to fame helping to bring down Richard Nixon. He and Carl Bernstein, his partner in that, there's a famous quote, uh, I think, from Carl saying, we didn't go after the president, we went after the story. But a lot of people, based on that, thought, oh, Woodward must be a Democrat. Then they found out when Democrats came to power, he was just as tough an investigative reporter in looking at them. And some on the, you know, kind of uh, intellectual left became disillusioned with Woodward. They say, oh, you know, he's... He's not really, you know, one of us ideologically. And the truth is, he's not an ideological man. He is a reporter. He believes in uncovering secrets. He believes in bringing more information to bear on the public debate. It has nothing to do with whether he's for or against Trump. This book is not an anti. Trump All right, D David. David, I hear what you say about. I hear what you say about peddling in of, facts. It's a piece of reporting. I, I hear what you say about about working on facts he, and, and, and doing reporting. But here's the problem. You have right. uh, so much information that's out there nowadays. We saw, for instance, a few years back with uh, the WikiLeaks uh, cable dumps where basically all the water cooler chat among diplomats was there out in the public exposed. In the end, uh, how much people believe facts anymore it seems to be diminishing. Right. That, that's true. And that's a problem many people have remarked on. A few years ago, there was a social network theorist who studied the books that we buy and presumably read from Amazon. And he drew them up into clusters. And on one side of the cluster were books by people like Michael Moore and other left-wing or liberal books, and on the other side were books by Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly and such. One of the few people in the middle whose books were bought by both clusters and by all the different clusters on this chat was Bob Woodward. He's someone who manages to maintain with, I think, 
most Americans at least, credibility of the t kind we all used to have in our daily reportage from the New York Times, from CBS News and so forth, that has in recent years kind of become, uh, come to crumble and become polarized. Woodward still holds on to that belief in just the facts. And to a large degree, people still uh, believe him. Now, when he publishes a book that's critical of a given administration, that administration, its surrogates, its lackeys and ditto heads are always going to come out after Woodward and say he's attacking this president. But when you look at the body of his career, he's not partisan. He's actually, for Washington, D.C., you know, a very ideological town, remarkably non-ideological, non-partisan. You know, uh, he's voted for Democrats. He's voted for Republicans. Um, he's just a different animal. He's, he's an old-fashioned reporter. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. I think Trump's obviously, for his own reasons, trying to discredit this book. But there's a lot of people who talked, a lot of tapes and notes of those conversations. Mark Porter? Well, then why did he release the book now? Uh, if I he may. could have waited. I mean, this is very suspect. What, I mean, what are you saying about the timing? Why is the timing suspect? Well, this is September, and the elections, the midterm elections, are coming up in November. We have the Kavanaugh uh, hearings that are going on right now. We had the the fall book season launching coming up now. It, it just seems like uh, what was proposed here to sort of protect Bob Woodworth, it doesn't make much sense to me. He could have waited. I mean, if he was going to have this book, why not spend years really getting into this? Having a book like this, where so many of the people in the book said that what they say isn't true, and I happen to believe them, it does seem to go to the credibility of Woodward, which apparently is why this particular gentleman is defending him. However, there are unanswered questions. Why doesn't Bob explain why I, does the book have to be launched right now? Seems strange to me. Uh, Joshua Mitchell, is there a conspiracy? I'm, if I may, I'm, I didn't come to the studio today to attack Bob Woodward or even really to defend Donald Trump. My interest is in explaining the situation in which we find ourselves right now. We've just had the McCain funeral in which the old line Republicans and the Democrats gathered together like one force. We have the Woodward book. We have Amorosa's book. We have any number of, of books and articles and journalists who are coming out opposed to Donald Trump. I'm, what I'm trying to explain is there's a reason why Americans continue to support him. And I gave the answer in the last segment. For the last two decades, the old Republican Party and the current Democratic Party has not given a darn about the middle class. They have both been touting versions of globalism. And so when at the McCain funeral, the Democrats and the Republicans dump on him, in the Woodward book, there is further dumping. People can't even see this or hear this anymore. It's not about Woodward's credibility. It's about how all of this stuff is playing out in America right now. And all of these books are, and, and these uh, journalists are simply contributing to people saying in the trenches out there, see, it's true. There is a great big conspiracy to keep the unfit man, who's not one of the globalists, out. That's how it's playing politically. I'm not going to defend or attack Woodward. I'm trying to explain the political the ambience of America at the moment. David Greenberg? The people dumping on Donald Trump are people in his own administration. They're his closest aides and confidants. They're the people he chose to help change the country. They're the ones in this Woodward book who are dumping. It's not Bob Woodward. He's playing the reporter. His own voice is not really in his books very much. Sometimes he gets criticized for that, for not offering enough interpretation. And, you know, perhaps as a literary matter, that's a valid criticism. But if you want the people, you know, this isn't George Bush or Barack Obama or Joe Biden dumping on Trump. This is Trump's own people. That's that's what's significant here. And and, and is there a, a precedent in history, David Greenberg? I'm, I'm We're always using the word unprecedented, David Greenberg. I, is it really though? Are, have there been other cases in the past in the United States? You know, I am one of those historians during the 2016 campaign, I always get calls and I would say, no, it's not unprecedented. And I would point to other figures and, and you know, certain precedents. 
I think now I've sort of been persuaded Trump's presidency truly is unprecedented. Um, we've never had anybody this unprepared and this sort of hungry for power and glory. And, you know, this sort of determined, and I think, you know, Professor Mitchell's right. He's, he's really against the establishment and to the extent that consensus has existed between the two parties. I think on some things it, it has and some it hasn't, but Trump is very much outside of that uh, consensus. So yes, in, in that sense, he is. Uh, temperamentally, he's quite different. The only one that I think comes close is Richard Nixon. I mean, Nixon publicly tried to put on a much more sober face, but we know from his private tapes how vindictive he was, how uh, you know angry he could be uh, toward his enemies, you know, and and some of these qualities that we see in, in Trump, uh, I think, do have their precedent in Richard Nixon. And we could probably go back to other presidents and say, well, he's like Andrew Johnson in respect, or he's like this president in that respect. A lot of the people he most resembles never got to be president. Joe McCarthy, for example, or maybe Huey Long. Some people have drawn the comparison. Um, All right, but we've see. never really oh. had anybody <laughs> like this. Huey in the Long. Office. Are you crazy? It's All right. Uh, Mark, Mark Porter shaking his head. Joshua Mitchell making an important point about... Long, a lot of people draw the comparison that you, that you ask. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll continue this discussion later about the, 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 the former Louisiana politician. Uh, the, 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 Joshua Mitchell making the point how right. both of the mainstream parties uh, are in turmoil in the United States. And the, he talked about that bipartisan spirit at last weekend's funeral of Arizona Senator John McCain. Last weekend is a memory that's fading fast when you see, for instance, the unprecedented scenes, and I'm using that word again, unprecedented, at the Senate Judiciary Committee's opening of hearings to confirm Trump's nominee to the Supreme Court, both sides trading accusations of obstruction, the Republicans by filtering documents on Brett Kavanaugh at the very last minute, and the Democrats by teaming up with protesters to disrupt the hearings. We cannot possibly move forward, Mr. Chairman. I extend this a very warm welcome we to Judge Kavanaugh. have not been given an opportunity to have a meaningful his wife, hearing Ashley. on this nominee. There are two daughters. Mr. Chairman, I agree with my colleague, friends. Senator Harris. Mr. Chairman, Judge we received 42,000 documents that we haven't been able else to review us last today. night, and we believe this hearing should I know be postponed. This is all right, so that was the scene. That was the scene in the Senate. By the way, we want to, we always welcome late arrivals. Paris traffic could not keep away uh, Lex Paulson, who lectures in rhetoric and human rights at uh, the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po. Welcome, welcome to the uh, belatedly to the to the discussion. Um, we it wasn't and it's it, it, it the the disruption uh, the uh, the both sides being fired up. We saw it with those judiciary hearings that took place Tuesday. Something else happened Tuesday night. Massachusetts uh, voting out uh, the establishment with uh, a Democratic primary uh, for the House of Representatives, virtually assuring 44-year-old Ayanna Presley of becoming the first black woman to serve the state in Congress after her upset victory over a 10-term incumbent. And uh, Joshua Mitchell, let me ask you, you know, the, 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 this Donald Trump disruptive way of, of governing, uh, we're seeing it on both sides. Uh, of the aisle. Where is it going? Is this good or bad for democracy? My argument is that uh, Donald Trump handed the Republicans a gift. Uh, it became clear that the fusion that had hold, held the Republican Party together for a generation, which was intellectually incoherent, um, had fallen apart. And now the Republicans are at least sitting down, the better of them, and they're asking the question, well, how do we rebuild our party? The Democrats were denied that gift because Hillary Clinton owns the Democratic Party. The Bernie Sanders socialist wing of the Democratic Party is very, very strong. Because all you have to do is compare readership uh, and viewership of CNN on the one hand and MSNBC on the other hand, 
and you'll see that the shift is to the left. So you're, you're getting, emerging in America, a new Trumpian party, uh, which will push the old Republicans out. The Republicans don't want to hear this, but it will. It's not clear what the Trumpian Republican Party is really going to look like. And then the titanic battle that we're seeing right now is in the Democratic Party. And it's not clear who's going to win, whether it's going to be the identity politics group that still is uh, held by Hillary Clinton or this new socialist move that's in a way farther left. Lex Paulson, how do you explain the, this polarization on both sides? What, what does it say about the world we live in today? Well, I have to disagree with the, with the, with the, the, the notion that the, the Democrats have the bigger uh, cleavages internally. All Democrats, whether it's Mike Capuano or Ayanna Presley or Joe Crowley or Alexandra Ocasio-Ortiz, are for universal health care, are for better investments in public education, are for fighting climate change, whereas Trump has taken the most prominent positions of the last 30 years of the Republican Party, whether it's free trade or uh, strong alliances with, you know, with, with, our, with our allies, and completely turned them on their heads. So I think the Republicans are the ones who are going to be going through much more of an identity crisis no, he hasn't. at this He's point. He's tested them. He uh, hasn't than, turned them on uh, their heads. Absolutely Democrats. not true. Absolutely not true. Not in fact, true? the Republican Party now is rebuilding itself. In fact, we so, are stronger than we've ever been. We'll see what the results of the midterms are. But in the RNC meetings, for example, we are much more organized, focused, and raising a lot more money than what's happening in Democratic Party, which is splitting apart. A bit like what we had with the Tea Party. It's not what the polls say. They say the House of Representatives is going to swing if the election were held. National polls, not the local polls. But what I'm talking about, too, is before when we had the problem with the Tea Party. The Tea Party was internally splitting apart the Republican Party, and it reformed, as was said before, how the Republican Party is today. That's exactly the same thing that's happening to the Democrats, except on a different scale, because Bernie Sanders isn't even a Democrat. Why, why the turmoil on both sides? That's I, my question. I think there's more of a generational shift than turmoil. And again, you didn't make any necessarily any, any, any given examples of, of actual issue differences between Ayanna Presley and, and Capuano. Or, I mean, th these incumbents that are losing are older white men. I agree there's an identity politics uh, element here. But Ocasio-Cortez and Presley ran very uh, competent, very professional, very uh, credible campaigns. And so I don't look at this as much as turmoil as a question of complacency among the old guard and a need to bring a new guard in, which is healthy for the party. More, more broadly, what we've been talking about here is how it seems as though everything plays out in public. And the, the, the book about... Uh, uh, Donald Trump is an example uh, uh, of that, where the chaos in the White House, it's there, and actually he plays on it as well. It's not, it doesn't seem to hurt him much in terms of, it's not going to, the panel in agreement that this isn't going to uh, hurt, hurt, dent his support. I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, what Donald Trump can't stand is for anyone to look at anyone else but him. I mean, he needs to be the center of attention at all times, wh whether, it's, whether it's on Twitter or at his rallies. And so I think this book, actually, probably he appreciates that everyone's still talking about the turmoil in the White House because it's a reality TV show. He's the still, uh, thinks of himself as the, as the orchestrator. The problem is we need someone to actually run the country, not just pull memos off the president's desk. The country is being very well run. Thank you. D David Greenberg, uh, uh, politics. Uh, well, and also, it, it, it's, it's the, the old Oscar Wilde line. It's better to be talked about than not to be talked about. Well, I was going to comment on Woodward. You know, he's done books like this for many decades now. So I don't think this kind of exposure of the White House is actually anything new. Um, it's true that we have a kind of constant turmoil and conflict in our political discourse, which I think stems a lot from 24-7 cable news, as well as social media like Twitter, creates a kind of continual sense of urgency and anxiety. But if you're looking at the kind of reporting that Woodward is doing and the, the, the literature of exposure, as it was called back in the progressive era, um, you know, that, that's something that we've had for a long time, and that's a really valuable part of democracy. A valuable part of democracy. Joshua Mitchell, the case has been made that uh, uh, Donald Trump... Uh, his presidency is also marked by a new age of inequality and uh, a lot of people comparing it to what was called the Gilded Age in the late 19th century. 
Well, I think this is going to be his big challenge. So uh, on paper, he is committed to something that, that neither the Republicans nor the Democrats were committed to, namely a middle class commercial republic. On paper, he's committed to that. Uh, it's not self-evident from the tax cut that was just passed that that's going to be the case. And I think the Trump presidency will not hang on all the noise that surrounds him as a person. It will hang finally on whether, uh, on whether he is able to deliver, to make good, on the promise to revitalize the middle class. And I will go so far as to make the following prediction. And the first one's going to sound like a prediction, but I think it's certain. He will win in 2024 or 2020. But if he is unable to deliver on making, on making the middle class strong and robust again, I think then we will have the Democratic Socialist wing, the Bernie Sanders and some of these newcomers, um, stepping in in 2024. And we will have some modest experiment in socialism if Trump is unable to deliver for the middle class. Lex Paulson? Well, uh, one of those moderate experiences in socialism is the health care we give to our veterans, for example, that, uh, that, that President Obama is now, because of our, our, our health care reforms, uh, made possible to more of the middle class and, and working poor in America, and that Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell tried to take away from them. So if you call that an experiment in socialism, um, I would try to explain that to the people in West Virginia and Ohio and Michigan uh, who are no. going to be worse off as a result of Donald Trump trying to make the American health care system a train wreck. Uh, and I think... Sorry. Uh, a train wreck. Uh, well, the Republicans it, have worked it, very hard to make it that way. But if you're a wealthy Republican, if you're a wealthy Republican donor, guess what? You bet sir, right in 2016 because sir, you got your tax cuts, you got you, got you get deregulation, <laughs> and you got your two Supreme Court justices. So I have to congratulate Mitch McConnell and the Koch brothers for having bet on the right side of the 2016 well, election. Koch is financing Democrats these days, isn't it? All right. A final, a final word from the historian, David Greenberg. Uh, Again, I, I, I come back to you with the same question as earlier about uh, an unprecedented presidency. Are these unprecedented times? Well, you know, the, everything in history is always new. We never directly repeat the past in, in simple patterns or cycles. We're certainly at a moment of disruption, uh, a moment of change, a pivot point. Uh, I think Trump is a symptom of that turmoil uh, as much as he is a cause, although I think he's doing his best to exacerbate the turmoil rather than to sort of restore some kind of new uh, order. Um, you know, you can find other moments in our history where similar turmoil existed. Uh, in the Great Depression, where we had the New Deal order came into play, arguably the 60s, which led to a kind of conservative dominance, but with a kind of strong, persistent uh, liberal underpinning. Um, and you can find moments in the 19th century of such turmoil, too. So, yes, we're in a different moment because every period is going to uh, have its own distinctive features. Um, but we have been through crises like this before. I think what's important to recognize is that it is a crisis uh, of democracy. And to go back to the question of the Woodward book, I do think that will account why this book, even more, it seems, than his usual popular books, is is drawing so much attention. People are hungry to understand what's happening in this White House and where the hell, you know, this president and others are are taking us because nobody really seems to know for sure. It certainly has our attention. I want to thank you so much, uh, uh, David Greenberg, for joining us from New York City. Joshua Mitchell in Washington, uh, D.C. Mark Porter, Lex Paulson. And thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.